Yeah. Okay. Welcome, everybody. So today's session, I'm going to talk about uh, creating smart endpoints using integration microservices. So in this session, I'm going to uh, primarily touch some of the key challenges that you uh, face when you are building microservices architecture. Uh, when it comes to integrating services and uh, building inter service communications. So, before we go into the details of uh, the microservices integration, let's look at uh, what microservices really are. Right? I think you most of you are really familiar with microservices, but just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. So, the uh, the description of microservices, we can define it as a way of building software applications as a collection of uh, independent and autonomous services. So these services are business capability oriented and obviously they are loosely coupled from each other. So, uh, so that is the foundational uh, description of uh, microservices architecture. Uh, but if you look at, uh, if you dig deep into the microservices architecture, the heart of the microservices architecture is the uh, breaking of the monolithic, uh, any of the monolithic runtimes that you have in your architecture. So uh, at the very, very beginning of microservices architecture, uh, we had uh, the elimination of central enterprise service bus. So with the elimination of central ESP, uh, it was suggested to use smart endpoint and dump pipes. So in today's session, I'm going to talk about what these smart endpoints and dump pipes really are and the key challenges and the solution that you can use when you are building this kind of an architecture. Now, uh, let's take uh, take a step back and look at uh, existing uh, monolithic architectural patterns, right? So if you look at uh, any of the uh, enterprise architectures, uh, you can obviously see there's an API management layer, then there's an integration layer, and then you have application data and systems that you can uh, integrate using a central ESP. I think still in most of the organizations, you will find this pattern. And uh, most in most cases, uh, this is a uh, very, very working uh, and uh, successfully working solution. But there are obviously limitations, right? So we owing to the central nature, centralized nature of enterprise service bus, uh, there is a lot of uh, business logic being put into this monolithic uh, runtime and uh, there are concerns related to agility and uh, how quickly you can build a new solution out of this kind of an architecture. And with the advent of other technologies such as containers and Kubernetes, so this monolithic architecture is not really scales for the most of the enterprises. So that's where we embrace microservices architecture where you have uh, uh, independent set of services talking to each other over the network and there's no any central integration layer as we had in the previous diagram. So what you have here is set of services, you have the connectivity between these services and there are supporting uh, messaging infrastructures uh, such as message brokers. Uh, in this case, it is used as an, as an event broker. So in this architecture, now in, in, in the previous architecture, ESP is acting as a uh, smart pipe that connects all the different services and systems. Now, in this case, what you have is you have a set of smart endpoints. All these microservices are smart endpoints and they are connected via uh, dumb communication channels. So it can be a pure HTTP communication or it can be uh, based on a dumb message broker uh, where you don't have that much of a business logic inside the broker. So uh, the entire integration logic that we had in the previous diagram now being dispersed across multiple microservices. So if you look at the microservices shown in A, B and E and F, so all these microservices are doing, um, rather than just focusing on the business logic of the service, it is also doing some uh, integration between other systems. So the, the, we, can, we can identify these services as smart endpoints. So, so obviously when you have that many services and you have connectivity between all these different services, uh, the implementation is becoming even more hard, right? So uh, because you don't have a, uh, don't have the required abstractions coming from the uh, central layer such as ESB because if you are using an ESP 
you know that you have all those capabilities already built into the ESP and you don't have to do that much of work at your application level. Now, the other complexity is uh, when, uh, so although we position microservices architecture as a way to ease your work, uh, so that you can easily build your new, build your new solutions, uh, this actually complicates your entire uh, integration of all these different applications and services. So uh, microservices uh, uh, fundamentally doesn't change the complexity of the integration, rather it uh, distributes the integration across set of services. Now, the, one of the best example is Uber. So this is uh, actually from, from this diagram is from one of their uh, tracing uh, tools where you can see all the different uh, inter-microservices communication. So they had like more than 1,000 services, and uh, this is uh, like a typical point-to-point -point architecture that we talked about uh, in the pre-ESP era. So obviously, integrating microservices is really hard. So that's why you need to have a, uh, that why, that's why you need to follow proper patterns and have a uh, proper technology to build these integrations. Now, another misconception that we have in this uh, area is that uh, service mesh versus integration, whether service mesh is a, uh, is a distributed ESP or not, right? So one of the reasons uh, for the inception of the service mesh is the exact same problem that we have seen in this diagram. So you have too many network communication. You need to have some uh, way to call your services in a resilient observable and secured manner. So that's why service mesh architecture came into the picture. So fundamentally service mesh provides you a abstraction layer, a sidecar uh, that sits alongside your microservice so that you can offload all your uh, logic, which is not related to the business logic to the sidecar component. So that's where you can implement all your routing uh, as well as security and uh, circuit breaking, resiliency, all those things can be offloaded to the sidecar and that can be controlled via a control plane. And But the thing is, you, you can't really offload your composition logic, the integration logic. So for instance, if you have to call two services and, a, and, a, and create a composite service, the cre creation of the composition has to be part of your uh, service that you develop. So you can't uh, offload that, that to the sidecar. So if you need to uh, find more information about this, uh, I have written about this at uh, this InfoQ uh, ebook, so you can find more details there as well. Now, if we try to map uh, this concept into a typical architectural deployment, uh, what you can see is uh, now we get rid of the ESP and we have set of microservices communicating with each other using different protocols. And on top of that, you can have the API gateway layer. And again, API gateway layer can also be segregated into individual micro gateways uh, uh, as needed. But uh, if your use case only requires uh, just a single gateway, you can use a monolithic gateway as well. And, and also the rest of your organization, uh, the rest of the organization that follows monolithic architecture can be also bring in uh, brought into this uh, uh, this architecture via uh, service interfaces so these services can actually talk to any proprietary or web apis through their service interface so this would be the typical deployment of a uh, smart endpoints and turnpipe style architecture and now let's look at some of the key fundamentals related to building uh, all these different integrations so the first thing is finding the right granularity because uh, if you build, uh, if your organization has thousand plus services, uh, unless if you are a, like a mega cloud or a very big enterprise or a very big enterprise with so many business capabilities, it is uh, sort of a sim symptom that you have followed uh, uh, some too much of a fine grain approach to build your services. So having thousand services. Uh, so the thing is, you need you need to have services which are proportional to the business capabilities that you offer to your consumers. Right. So if you have like ten business capabilities and you have thousand services, so uh, it is not a proper design. 
So again, uh, from Uber, they came up with uh, this domain-oriented microservices architecture recently. And uh, in fact, it's a, it's a new way to uh, present uh, architecture and basically categorize different arc, uh, microservices into domains. But the core of their uh, problem is the far too much of a fine grain uh, design to their microservices. So they had thousands of microservices, for instance, uh, one engineer had to work through uh, 50 services uh, across different uh, 12 different teams to investigate a problem so that is not what you want to do right so the uh, the main thing you have to do here is to identify the business functionality of the service and uh, scope it around that capability so you should you shouldn't be worrying about the lines of code or uh, how many team members working on the on that particular microservice so once you have the proper granularity then you can start looking into different uh, service in locations and when you are using a technology to build this kind of a microservice and an integration microservice you need to have a technology that caters uh, these needs such as abstractions for inter-service communication uh, so you don't have to write a lot of low-level code to build uh, these integrations and also the ability to do, integrate with different systems such as uh, SaaS or web APIs and also proprietary and legacy systems such as ERPs. Then, uh, so then when you are building these communications between these services, you, you can follow different communication or composition patterns. So one uh, main thing that you can follow is the service orchestration, so active composition, where you actively call set of uh, other services synchronously and to the composition and also you can do choreography where you use reactive approach primarily based on events so there's an event coming in and there's a uh, service that is listening to that event and based on the event you can emit uh, some other events as well so the same concept can be further extend uh, into event sourcing uh, where you keep a consistent set of uh, event log as well as uh, cqrs where you basically segregate your querying and command part of your service into two different service runtimes. So then uh, the technologies that you're going to use for this kind of a uh, service development has to support uh, containers uh, out of the box. Basically, they should offer native container support and native Kubernetes support. So that also requires to have different uh, other resource uh, limit uh, constraints such as fast boot up time, low resource consumption. And if you have a built-in operator such as a, a Kubernetes operator to operate your integration within a given a cluster, that will be much easier to manage uh, the entire life cycle of your integration service. Then uh, certain communication, certain integration patterns. Uh, so if you are from a uh, enterprise integration uh, background, I think you are familiar with the enterprise integration patterns that you find in uh, ESP space. So there are certain set of uh, integration patterns that are uh, still applicable in this domain as well, such as forking, joining, splitting, uh, and so on. So ability to do support it out of the box uh, is an added advantage as well. And uh, in, in most cases, uh, you don't use service mesh. In, at least currently, you don't service, use service mesh in production in most of our uh, customers. So then you need to have reliable uh, inter-service communication. So that's where you need to have built-in resiliency capabilities such as circuit breaking, retries, timeout, and uh, those things built into the technology that you are using. So, if you're using an integration technology and if you, are, if you can easily use a circuit breaker when you invoke a service, uh, that's basically cut down the development time significantly. And uh, especially when you are using uh, event-driven uh, or message-based communication, you need to have uh, reliable communication. So uh, we talked about uh, smart endpoints and dump pipes, right? So in, in most cases, uh, in pre-microservices era, the brokers that we used to have, are, they, are, they are smart. There are a lot of smarts, a lot of routing logic uh, that are baked into the brokers. Now, with this architecture, 
uh, you will basically use the broker as a pure dumb broker and your consumers, the, the consumers or the producers, that's where all the smarts uh, lies, right? So you, you are basically, uh, basically the solutions such as Kafka or even Nets. So they offer these capabilities uh, as part of the product itself because the, those brokers are providing the required uh, infrastructure level uh, guarantees but you don't have that much of a business logic as part of the broker so you that that part has to be done as part of your service so when you're choosing this uh, integration technology and if you have the capabilities to integrate with these brokers easily that's uh, that's an, uh, that will basically cut down the time that you have to spend on building that kind of a service and also when you have to deal with a lot of services, you, that means you have to deal with a lot of types, a lot of data representations. Uh, so one service can represent student, one service can uh, represent a, a person, then you have to do some mapping between the two. So then you, you need to have uh, proper type definition schemes uh, as part of your microservice development. Uh, for example, you can use proto buffers. Uh, or Avros, Avro for defining service interfaces and message types. And in certain cases, if you don't want to do everything programmatically, then you need to have some graphical type mapping between these types as well. So if, if your underlying solution offers these things as part of the uh, as part of its features, uh, that is an added advantage as well. Then you have the, uh, we talked about events and uh, reactive uh, communication. So events and event streams are also getting very popular. So this diagram actually shows you a, a complete use case built using an event oriented architecture. So uh, the key idea here is that you have events and you have event streams. Right? So events is uh, more or less acting against a single event that you uh, that a particular system emits and event stream is all about processing a set of event streams uh, uh, more of a in a stateful manner so you have multiple events coming in and you statefully process each and every events and you can also produce new events out of that as well so there are certain uh, new te new technologies on event stream processing the built-in tech uh, the built-in languages to process events in the uh, style of a stream so if your service requires this kind of stream processing uh, then the underlying technology needs to have the required abstractions as well and uh, workflows and sagas so sagas is a way of uh, running distributed transaction across multiple microservices so with the concept of a saga what you are doing is you uh, run a one particular coordinator, a Saga execution coordinator, which runs across multiple, uh, basically which invokes multiple microservices and you maintain the state in a distributed law. So if the use case requires to have some stateful workflows uh, in your microservice, then, then you need to follow a Saga implementation, such as a uh, distributed log based uh, orchestration uh, or business process engine. Now we looked at so many features related to smart endpoints and dump pipe development. And uh, let's have a look at some of the offerings that we have from WSO2 side. Uh, so uh, as part of the WSO2 Enterprise Integrator 7.1, we offer some of these capabilities uh, as part of the product. So uh, if you look at, uh, so ESP uh, EI 7.1 is a sort of a combination of multiple uh, unified product offering for multiple uh, integration scenarios. So you can do microservices integration, so it can be used as a central, a central ESB, or it can be used for data and streaming integration, uh, and also support for other connector integration as well. So web APIs and legacy system integration is also part of it. So one of the main thing that we included uh, in this release is the ability to integrate different microservices and natively supporting Docker and Kubernetes. And at the same time, we uh, provided uh, the enterprise service bus capabilities. So you don't have to switch between different runtimes. So if your use case is all about uh, building an ESP, you just deploy all the integration into the same runtime. But if you, 
want to deploy these integrations independently, then you can uh, create all these runtimes independently and run them as maybe as uh, pods in Kubernetes. And also streaming integration is a, uh, is a added component of the platform where you can, if you have to do uh, scenarios such as change data capture or ETL, then you can use streaming data runtime to do uh, those integrations as well. And also we have done, uh, the team have, have done some major changes to the uh, graphical tooling. We have been completely revamped the uh, development experience. Uh, it's, it's not just the tooling, but the entire development experience has revamped. So this is some uh, experience shots from the graphical tool. And we had uh, we have included some pre-built integration scenarios for the most of the scenarios that we talked earlier. And uh, also data transformation uh, built into the tool, as well as testing and debugging, and also unit testing, uh, as well as the integration connectors. So, uh, and also uh, ballerinas, I think most of you have heard of ballerina, the la programming language that we have been working on. So, uh, so that's another great technology to use in uh, building smart endpoints and dump pipes. And you can look forward for more stuff, more exciting stuff coming in uh, from ballerina in the future as well. So with that, I would like to conclude my session.